Okay, so uh, regarding Genesis 44, as Michael was reading that, you probably noticed that the, the second half of this chapter is a repeat of the same things we've been reading about in the last two chapters. So I'll be focusing most of my sermon on the first half of this chapter. Okay, the first half of this chapter. And I've called the title for this sermon, Lessons in Humility. Lessons in Humility. So um, as you know, we're, we're called to be humble people. Okay, and what's the opposite of humility? Pride, okay? And, and it's easy to be prideful. Easy. Uh, you know, your default setting in life is pride, okay? You're, you're, always trying, you're always thinking the best of yourself. You're always thinking everyone else is wrong. I'm the one that's right. Everyone does, has done wrong to me. I've only done good to others. But really, when you measure yourself up to the Bible, you realize, hey, I'm not that, I'm not that good actually, actually right? I, I, I need to work on humility. Humility is something you really need to work on. I think we see a lot of good uh, examples of humility in this chapter as we read through it. So let's start off with verse number 1, Genesis 44, verse 1. And he commanded the steward of his house. Now, who's the steward of his house? That's the guy that's overseeing his house. He's, he's a household manager. You know, he's got his hands on, 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 on the developments, the finances, the, the, the services that are going on, the, you know, all the other servants. This steward is looking after all of that. And so he commands the steward saying, fill the men's sacks with food, who are the men? That's the brothers of Joseph, right? They've come back to Egypt. If you remember on Wednesday, we're looking at that. They've come back. They've run out of food. They've wanted to purchase some new food. So they've gotten the food, not just the food, but it says here, as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. So it's a repetition of what they did last time, right? Joseph says, we don't want their money. Put their money back into their sacks, okay? Uh, so basically, they're now getting two portions of food for the first time. They bought some, the second portion of food, and it's all free. Okay, it's all free. They're getting all their money back for it. But look at verse number two. And put my cup, this is Joseph's cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. All right, so Joseph said, not just the money, not just food for the youngest, that's Benjamin, not just his money, but also take my silver cup. I suppose this is his, his uh, special cup that he eats at his dining table. Uh, so it's very, it's very expensive. It's, it's made of silver. It's put into the sack of, of Benjamin. And it, at the end of verse number two, it says, And he did, that's the steward, and he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. Now the reason he does this, as you've sort of seen as through the chapter, is that Benjamin will be blamed for taking that cup and Benjamin would be returned back to Egypt. And Joseph's desire would be that Benjamin would stay with him, basically. Obviously, that's his full blood brother. He wants to spend time with him. And this is a, a way, I don't know whether this, you know, you could say this is, I guess, wrong, a wrong way of doing it. But anyway, he wants his brother to come and, and, and spend time with his brother, which is why he puts this in motion. But the first thing I want you to notice here is the steward, okay? What did it say about the steward? He did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. Now, the steward could easily say, well, I don't think this is right, Joseph. I don't, I don't think what, what you're doing here is right. But he goes ahead and he does what Joseph had asked of him. And the first lesson that I have in humility is for you to be obedient to the authorities in your life. Be obedient to the authorities in your life. And, and often when you think of a steward, this is one title that is given to a pastor, you know, to a bishop of a church. Titus 1.7 uh, says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. You know, if you're going to take on the office of a bishop or a pastor, you're called a steward of God. And you know, just like the steward of Joseph, you need to do according to the word that God had spoken. Whatever it is that God asks you as the steward of God, as the one that's looking after the house of God, right? You need to make sure that you do things in accordance to the word of God. And you know, that is one way for you to judge me as your pastor. One way for you to determine whether this pastor is doing well or, or not so well is to determine, is this pastor, is Pastor Kevin Sepulveda, you know, teaching this church, running this church, operating this church in accordance to God's will. And if I'm doing that, hey, I'm a good steward. If I'm not doing that, well, I need to work on it, right? But this is a lesson of humility. But please go to uh, Luke chapter 12 now. Please go to Luke chapter 12. Because it's not just pastors that are called to be a steward of God. In fact, all of you, all of you are called to be a steward for, the, our, for our Lord God. Uh, Luke chapter 12, please. Luke chapter 12. And let's look at verse number 42. 
Luke 12, 42. Luke 12, 42 reads, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Now, this is in the context of the last days. This is the context of the end times, of the coming of Christ. And Jesus is asking, who is that faithful and wise steward? You see, all of us are are called to be a steward of God, okay? And Jesus is asking the question, but which of the stewards is wise and faithful, all right? And those that are wise and faithful to the Lord, He's going to make Him ruler over His household. He's going to give those heavenly rewards that we often think about, that we often talk about, those heavenly rewards for those that are a faithful and wise steward, okay? And brethren, listen, you are a steward of God. God has you on this earth. Yes, you're saved, but did you realize that after you got saved, you didn't go to heaven? Did you notice that you're still here on this earth? You know why? Because you've got, you're, you're operating now as a steward of God. The Bible also calls us ambassadors. You know, we're here to represent God. We're here to do His work. We're here to do His business. But let's get the context of this verse. Let's start off in verse number 35. In what way are we to be a faithful and wise steward? Verse number 35, Luke 12, 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. So this is what we're called to do. We're meant to put on our belts, gird ourselves. You know, we're putting our belts on. It means we're dressed. We're ready to go, right? We're getting ready to start the work. You get up in the morning, you put on your clothes, you get out of your pajamas, or maybe you sleep in the clothes you're working, I don't know. (laughs) But you know, you're ready to work, right? You're girded and your lights are burning. And the reason why the lights are burning here is because we're going to see the context of night. You know, so even even though in in this parable, in this story that Jesus speaks, it's, it's it's about nighttime. And so this steward has their lights burning, they've got the lights on. They've got their torches ready to go. Hey, they're ready to work even in the night. They're ready. They're they're, they're good to go. Verse number 36. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. So so he gives an example of, of some servants that are looking after the house of the Lord. That Lord's gone off to a wedding. He's coming back, right? And the expectation when he comes back, is that they'll open the door. The expectation, no matter what time of the night he comes, the servants of that house are going to be ready to receive him. They're going to be ready to serve him. So they've got their lights on. You know, that they're looking forward to the coming of their Lord. And this is the parallel for us, that we ought to be looking for the coming of our Lord, the second coming of the Lord. And we need to be working. We need to be ready. We need to have our lights shot. Not, not asleep. You know, not being lazy Christians. No, we ought to be ready serving the Lord. Verse number 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he, shall, that he, the Lord that is, shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Man, I, I can't understand this, right? God wants us waiting. He wants us working. He wants us faithful for his coming. But when the Lord comes... He's going to serve us, right? He's going to gird himself up as a servant. He's going to honor us. He's going to get us to sit down and enjoy the meal, right? So we're going to sit next to, across from Abraham, across from David, you know, across from, you know, Paul and across from Peter, you know, across from these great men of God. We're all going to be sitting at that table when the Lord comes back and Jesus Christ will come and, come and serve us. And so he wants us waiting. He wants us watching for his coming. Verse number 38 and he shall come in the second watch. Sorry, and if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. Why are we blessed if we're found watching, working for him? Because he's going to bless us. He's going to reward us, okay? Verse number 39. You know, I, I want, I want, I don't know, what's your favorite meal? You know, when, when you go out and you, and you, you eat takeout, you know, I know brother um, Jason loves Indian food, right? So, you know, if God finds him watching, you know, guess what you're going to get, brother? You're going to get your butter chicken, all right? <laughs> and you get, you know, you're going to get, you know, what you deserve. You know, as long as you're there faithfully serving him, he's going to honor you with a great meal. You know, verse number 39, For this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched 
and have not suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Verse 41, And Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of me in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. And of course, this would be the millennial reign, you know, being a ruler with Christ, ruling and reigning with Christ in that millennium. But what was it again, guys? What, what is the instruction? How is it that we watch and wait? Do we just look up into the skies, look at the clouds and be ready in that sense? No, verse 35, right? We start with verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. You know, you've got to shine the light of Christ. Okay, you've got to be working. You've got to be serving the Lord. You've got to be serving your church. And you can't hide the light that you have, brethren. The gospel light that brings salvation into this world. You've got to let that light burn. And so when the Lord comes back, He wants to see you working for Him. He wants to see you with that light. Not hiding. Not hiding from the persecution. Not hiding in the time of tribulation. Afraid to lose your head. No, shining that bright lightly being a representative, being that good steward of God. You know, but this requires humility, all right? It requires humility to be under the authorities that you have in your life. And we saw this steward of Joseph. He was ready. He was ready to do whatever Joseph had asked him, had asked of him. And we too, brethren, need to be ready to be those good stewards, ready to do anything that the Lord Jesus Christ asked from us. And so we see the context here about the end times and and I see this is an important attribute to being a good steward. So um, some of the men already know this, but soon, maybe, maybe Wednesday, maybe next, maybe next week, I'm not sure, I'll be starting a series on the end times, okay? Why? Because it's exciting, yes, it's awesome, but I want to make sure that we're good stewards of God, right? That we're, that we're aware of, of the Lord's return, we understand what the future holds in accordance to God's Word, so we can be ready to serve Him no matter what, even in, in, the difficult, even in difficult times. Please go back to Genesis 44, verse 3. Genesis 44, verse 3. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? You know, wherefore have you rewarded evil? Now, did they really do evil? No, they didn't steal that silver cup, okay? But, you know, why is it? The question is to ask, you know, why did you reward evil for good? So we want to take these lessons, right? Should we, should we reward evil? I'm uh, sorry, should we reward good for evil? You know, someone that does good to you, should you render them back evil things? No. And that would be a very wicked thing to do, right? Someone does good to you, and you just spit in their face about it, you know, and you just do evil in return, please go to Psalm 38. Psalm 38, verse 20. Psalm 38, verse 20. Now, you probably say, well, I would never do evil to someone that's done good to me, okay? And probably so, okay? It, it takes a pretty wicked heart to do that. But I promise you this. I'm sure you've experienced the reverse, right? I'm sure you've done good to people and they've done evil to you in return. I'm sure you've had that experience. We've all had that experience. It's not just you. You thought it was just you. No, no, all of us. Right? All of us have done good to certain people and they've just returned evil to us. Look at verse number 20, Psalm 38, verse 20. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries because I follow the thing that good is. Look what he says. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me. Oh, Lord, my salvation. Listen, when someone's done evil to you after you've done good to them, wh what are you burning to do? Take revenge, right? You know, render evil for evil. Especially when they've done it, after you've done good, right? Now, it's one thing for someone to just do evil to you for no reason. And then, you know, even that's hard to do good unto them. But how much harder is it when you've done good first and then they've done evil to you? Okay? But here's the thing, and I think the psalmist realizes 
that he's going to take revenge. I think he realizes this is hard for him to accept. So what does he do? What does he do when someone has done evil to him after he's done good? He goes to the Lord, right? Forsake me not, O Lord. Oh my God, be not far from me. He, he needs the Lord, brethren. And that's what you're going to need. You know, it's going to take a bit of humility to be able to overcome when people do evil to you. And here's what's going to help you. Just run into the Lord. Just saying, Lord, you help me. Make 20, verse 22, make haste to help me. Hurry up, Lord. Right? right now, I feel like taking revenge on these evil people. I feel like destroying these evil, wicked people. He says, make haste, O Lord, to help me. O Lord, my salvation. I like that about the psalmist. Because, you know, a lot of the psalms, they're just like, it's a guy without a filter. Right? It's just, he's got an open heart to the Lord. And he shed, you know, David wrote many of the psalms. But all the other psalmists, you know, they're just expressing human nature many times. And just a need for God. And they realize, you know, I can't, how, how can I put up with this God? You know, I need you. I need you when people do evil to me after I've done good to them. I'll just read another passage. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. See that none render evil for evil. Do you think this requires a bit of humility on your part? Absolutely. All right. You know why you feel like rendering evil for evil? Pride. That's why. You know, ego, they've hurt your feelings. You know, you get a little bit sensitive about it. How dare that person say that about me or do that to me? Just go to God. Just go to God. Let Him sort it out. You know, He's, like, he's your help. He's already saved you from hell. You think he can save you from some idiot, you know, causing you some evil? Of course he can. Okay, he's already saved you from the worst punishment, the worst thing you could possibly go through. You know, the Lord there is, is there for your help. You know, don't render evil for evil. You do what's good. And that requires humility. To so go, you know what, Lord? I'm just going to serve you. I'm just going to do what you said in your word. You know, even this enemy that's doing evil to me, when I cross his paths next time, I'm going to do him good. In fact, I might even go out of my way and do him good. Lord, I can only do that with your, with your help. 1 Peter 3.16 say, says, Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And I, I think this is a reality that I've seen play out in my life many times. And, you know, and I, I hope you've seen this in your life as well. But see... What it said there in 1 Peter 3, 6, 16, having a, a good conscience. And I've already preached on this, but having a good or a clear conscience before God is so valuable to me. It's just, you know, I'm not having these regrets in life. You know, I'm, I'm not constantly having to, you know, uh, revisit mistakes that I've made, you know, and just what could I have done differently or better? You know, and I see sometimes people just bogged down with their past mistakes, Right? They, they don't have that clear conscience before God. In order for us to have a clear conscience, just let people speak evil of you. They speak evil of you. All right, look. You know, it says that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ, your good behavior in Christ. You know, someone says evil things about you. Someone falsely accuses you. You just keep doing what's good. You just keep doing what's right. You just keep having a good conscience before God. The Bible says they will be ashamed. There will come a day when they will be shown for, for their wickedness. You know, and here's the thing, here's what's hard about it. Some people will say evil about you and people around that, they hear that will believe it. But it's just temporary. They'll believe it for a while. And what's going to be hard for you is to be like, I need to fix this. I need to go and show how I've not, you know, defend yourself. Look, you just keep doing what's right. If, if it's a false accusation, and you're just serving God, you're just doing what's good, just keep doing what's good. And I promise the tables will turn at some point. It's going to turn even, it's going to turn even better than what you expected. I've, I've experienced that many times in my life. All right, When the, the person that's making accusations about you or treating you evilly, it's like it's turned back on them. And again, we see that in the Psalms. You read the Psalms, how many times do we see the evil falling in their own traps? You know, the Lord just allows the, you know, those tables to be turned and for you to profit from that. But that requires humility. You know, the second point of, of, of humility there is to render good for evil. Render good for evil. Just do it, brethren. Just do good. Trust me. 
trust God. It's going to work out for you. It's going to work out for your best. When you just do good to those that have done you evil. That's point number two. That's going to help you, in, you know, with your humility. You know, measuring your, your how, how, how humble are you really? You know, do you render good for evil? That's point number two. Back to Genesis 44 verse 5. Genesis 44 verse 5. So we have this silver cup in, in, the, in the sack of Benjamin. And then verse number five, is not this it, sorry, is not this it in which my Lord drinketh and whereby indeed he divineth? He have done evil in so doing. All right, so, um, you know, the, the accusation here, of course, is that the silver cup has been stolen from, from uh, Joseph and stolen by Benjamin. But quite interesting here, just one little fact. Um, it says that the silver cup is by which he divineth. Okay, so... We know that Joseph could tell the future, all right? He was given that gift by God, okay? That's why he could tell, interpret dreams. You know, the, these people that would have these dreams, he could then tell them what their future held for them. But it looks like even after he was given this cup, this silver cup, so he's already in this, this position, second in command or in authority in all of Egypt, he was still able, he still was able to foretell uh, many things to come, many of the future things to come. And I think, I think this, this cup just sort of... Um, uh, is like a, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a token of his authority, of his wisdom, of, of his might. And so, you know, he, you know, what I can gather from this is that Joseph continued being a, a advisor, you know, of, of Pharaoh, um, even after he already had interpreted those dreams. But verse, so, so this cup is kind of valuable, right? It, it's, a, it's like a token, it's a representation of Joseph's authority and his ability to foretell dreams or foretell the future. Verse number six. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words, God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold the money which we found in our sacks' mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? So the brothers are making, you know, uh, uh, putting their defense forward. They said, look... We, we didn't steal it. Like, we didn't steal this cup. We, we've already shown you that when we've had the money returned to us, we've gone back, we tried to repay it. You know, why? if we've done that, why then should we try to steal this silver cup or, you know, steal the Lord's Joseph's silver or gold? Verse number nine. With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, let, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. So they're like so confident they've not stole this cup. I said, look, if you find one of us that's, that's if, if you find that we stole it, if you got proof of that, let, him, let that person die and we'll be under bondage for that person for the rest, of, like all of the brethren. So they're, they're you know, they're, they're making quite a, quite a statement there, I suppose. You know, they, they, they believe they're innocent. And of course they are innocent. But verse number 10, and he said, now also let it be according unto your words, he with whom it is found shall be my servants and ye shall be blameless. Now what I've taken out of this story here is that these brethren are willing to be to to uh, be punished if they're found to have done wrong, okay? They're willing to be punished for their sins if they had done such a thing. And I think this is the third lesson we can take from humility is that you ought to be open to punishment or correction for your sins. All right? You ought to be willing to say, Lord, if I've done wrong, I deserve the judgment. I deserve to be found out. I deserve to be corrected. You know, I deserve to be chastised. And here's the thing. Your natural response would be, I don't want to be punished for my sins. I don't want to be accountable for the wrong that I've done. And so it requires humility for you to be able to say, yes, I'm deserving of the punishment. I'm deserving of the wrongdoing that I've done. You know, and, and, you know, for the children, you know, if you've disobeyed your parents, you've done what's wrong, you know, you've broken your parents' uh, you know, instructions or commands in, your, in the house, you ought to be, you know, you ought to be willing. This requires humility to go to your parents and say, Mom, Dad, I've done wrong. You told me to do X, Y, and Z, but I didn't do it. I broke your commandments. You told me not to take the chocolate in the pantry. Mom, I took a piece. All right, you ought to be willing to go and just face the music. Be willing to take the punishment, the correction for the wrong you've done. But this requires humility to own up to your mistakes. Say, yes, I've done wrong. 
yes, I deserve to be punished. Now, these guys are innocent, but they're willing to say, well, you know what? If we've done wrong, then we'll be your bondmen. You know, you can take us. You know, we can be punished for the wrong that we've done. And this definitely requires uh, humility. Please go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Because they're, they're being... Uh, They've been accused of, of being uh, thieves, right? They've been accused of theft. And when I look at, again, the qualifications of a pastor, the kind of pastor, you know, if that's something you want to do, want to be, you know, you have to understand, you know, Titus, Titus 1.7. Now, their, their defense was that they were blameless, right? But Titus 1.7 says about the pastor or the bishop, for the bishop must be blameless, right? As the steward of God, we saw that already, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, but also this, not given to filthy lucre. Not given to filthy lucre. You know, a pastor ought not to be one that's doing it for the money. You know, that, that's, that's just trying to, to take what belongs to others and being a thief, as it were, to be greedy for money. No, he ought to be blameless and not greedy for filthy lucre. Not greedy for the riches of this world. All right, and, and so what we get out of this story is they're saying, look, we're blameless. We would never have stolen that thing. I mean, they've got good character about that, right? They've got good character about them. And so as I was thinking about this, I'm just reminded about the role of a pastor. Do you know there are pastors that are, that are after your money? Okay, there are pastors that will make you feel guilty. I mean, some pastors, I don't know how, they know whether you've tithed or not. They know whether you've put money in the offering or not. And if you haven't, they'll come and tell you. Now, should you give your tithe? Absolutely. But that's between you and the Lord. It's not between you and me. All right? It's between you and the Lord. But there are some pastors that will basically demand your money, demand your wealth. Okay? They will try to make you feel sorry for them. And say, look, I'm going without. You know, so give me, give me, give me. Right? Or, like the prosperity preachers do, put it in. And God will give you everything you want in this life. God will give you all the desires of your flesh. God will give you the mansions and God will give you the big cars and the, the big bank account. Now look, that will happen in heaven. You're treasured in heaven, but not, not here on this earth. But there are many pastors just want that they're doing it for filthy lucre. And you've got to realize, brethren, you know, I say this because I don't expect everybody here to be in New Life Baptist Church for the rest of your life. Okay? Or, who knows, we could have a change of pastors one day, right? It's not really my desire, but it, it could happen, right? And you need to be a, aware of the people that are taking advantage of you. Look at John 10, 7. John 10, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Jesus is the door of the sheep. We know that Jesus is the door to heaven, right? He says, everyone, everyone else that promised you heaven, everyone else that came with another religion, another way to be right with God, he says, all of them are thieves and robbers. Listen, if it's not Jesus, everybody else is a thief and robber. Buddha is a thief and a robber. Muhammad was a thief and a robber. Joseph Smith was a thief and a robber right what else i don't know you know the, the roman catholic virgin mary that's a thief and a robber okay it's not the mary of the bible okay who's a humble woman all right i mean what other what other false gods are there you know the, the false gods of the bible the devil is a thief and a robber if anyone comes to you saying there's a, another way to heaven those that knock on your doors the jw's the mormons they're thieves and they're robbers they're not pointing you to Christ. They're not saying that He's a door to heaven. Let's keep going. Verse number 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Man, what an awesome thing. How are we saved? Going through the door. Who's the door? I am the door, said Jesus. It's only Jesus, brethren. Not Jesus and turn from your sins. Hey, the one that's teaching that doctrine is a thief and a robber. Anyone that says Jesus plus whatever is a thief and a robber. Anybody saying that is a thief and a robber. Okay, it's Jesus. And if you enter through the door of Jesus, you will be saved. 
and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they, that they might have it more abundantly. More abundantly. You know, brethren, now that you're saved, are you living a life more abundant? Are, are you living a life, you know, are, do you have more joy in your life? Do you have more blessings in life? Can you appreciate the life that you have more now that you're saved than you did before? I hope so. Because that's the life Jesus has come to give you. Right? He did not come to put us, to put these pressures and these, these burdens upon you. That's what the thief and the robber does. He says, no, just walk through the door. I am the door. You can find the green pastures there. He wants us to enjoy our lives. Verse number 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. So what does a good shepherd do? He gives his life. Jesus Christ gave his life. Is he asking for you to give something to him? He's saying, hey, give me like a thief or a robber. No, the thief or robber wants something for themselves. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I gave my life for you. You don't get saved by giving your life to Jesus. You don't get saved by committing your life to Jesus. You don't get saved by saying, I'm going to just serve you, Jesus, for the rest of my life. That's not salvation. Salvation is Jesus giving his life for us. His death, burial, his resurrection, paying for your sins. What a beautiful thing. What an amazing thing. Verse number 12. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd. Now we can take this, yes, to religious leaders, but I want you to think about your pastors, right? Pastors, people that you've sat under before, or maybe pastors that you may have in the future. Here's how you know if he's a hireling or if he's a good shepherd. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep, whose own the sheep are not, see if the wolf come in and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. Brethren, pastors, you know, that are after money, pastors that are hirelings. They don't care for the sheep. When the wolf comes, guess where they are? They're out of there. They're gone. They scatter the sheep. They don't care about the sheep. You need to wake up and find out, hey, is this pastor, is this shepherd somebody that's following after the steps of Christ? Does he care for the sheep? Is he gathering the sheep? Is he doing it for the money? Hope not. If he's doing it for the money, hey, if he flees when the wolf comes, that's a hireling. That's not a shepherd for you to get yourself under. Protect yourself. Protect yourself from wicked men, wicked false religions, wicked pastors that are out there trying to take advantage of you. See, Jesus is totally opposite. He wants to give himself to the sheep. He wants to lay down his life and serve the sheep that he has. He wants to give them green pastures instead of putting unnecessary burdens upon them. Back to Genesis 44. Please, Genesis 44. Verse 11, Genesis 44, verse 11. Then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. Why? Because they just said, look, if you find it, let him die. They basically said, they put a death penalty on Benjamin basically. And Benjamin is the one that his father did not want him to remember go into the land of Egypt. Judah had promised that he was going to return. He's going to protect Benjamin, bring him back to his father. And so they're sorrowing. Verse number 14. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, and for he was yet there. And they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? And how shall we clear ourselves? God have found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also, with whom the cup is found. So he's pleading to Joseph. I mean, for them, they, they, they just, the evidence is there. Was it falsely planted? Yes. But they, they can't defend themselves, right? They had promised that Benjamin would die. But do you notice that he's trying to save Benjamin's life now? saying, look, let us just all be bondmen. Let us just all be your servants, right? Verse number 17. And he said, this is what Joseph said to them, God forbid that I should do so. 
but the man in whose hand the cup is found. He shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. So Joseph says, look, no, no, it's, it's not right for all of you to be bondmen here. Only the one to whom we found the cup in, right? And that's Benjamin. He's the one that will become my servant. And by that process, you can now be free. You can now go back to your father. And so, you know, obviously we know that Benjamin is innocent. Did he steal that silver cup? No, he didn't steal it. But he was found in his sack, right? And it wouldn't be right for him to be accountable for this. But by taking accountability of taking this cup, his brethren would be free, right? Please go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. And uh, again, this is just a parallel that I just, I can't overlook. The parallel of Christ, right? I mean, Benjamin is innocent. But if he takes responsibility, think about it. His brothers are free. They can go back. Matthew 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. And he went a little further, this is Jesus, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You know who else was an innocent person who was found with that cup? It was Jesus. He wasn't deserving of taking that cup, you know, the sacrifice for our sins, being punished for our sins. He was innocent. He was innocent. But here's what would happen. If he would just drink of that cup, if he would just take that cup, we would be saved. We would be free. You know, what a parallel there. Look at verse number 42, same chapter. And he went again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. What an amazing thing for Christ to take on our sins, to take on our punishment. But what did he want? Was he looking for his own will? Hey, we see the will of Jesus there was to not partake of that cup. He was hoping there'd be another way. But what do we learn? We're, we're talking about humility here, right? Jesus Christ was humble enough to say, well, not my will, Lord, but thine be done. The will of the Father be done. The fourth point that I have for you when it comes to humility is that you need to learn to set aside your will and do God's will. Set aside your will and do God's will. How hard? You know, I mean, it's not right for Benjamin to take the blame, right? It's not right. Is it really right that Jesus died for us? What was right, what was just, is that we would die in our sins, that we would go to hell, that we would face that punishment for all eternity. That would be right. But then we have the mercy of God. We have the humility of Jesus Christ to do what the Father has asked for him, the love of Christ, the love of God to save us from our sins. And you know, when we go soul winning, the person at the door we're going to get saved is the one that's willing to be humble, to say, yeah, I've sinned. Yes, I'm deserving of hell. Only then, when they understand that truth, when they can bring themselves to humility there, only then can they truly understand and believe on the gift of salvation, Jesus Christ. And what a great thing to know that Jesus would do such a thing for us. You know, if Benjamin took the blame there, wouldn't you say, man, what a great man. What a great man to take that cup, even though he's innocent, to take responsibility for it so his brothers can go free. Or well, how much more did Jesus do for us? How much more, okay? Genesis 44, verse 18. Genesis 44, verse 18. And um, so this is now sort of the, uh, it's really a recap of the last two chapters. So I'm going to speed through these, but I do have one other thing that I want to take out of this. Verse 18. Then Judah came near, came near unto him and said, O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. As thou saidst unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down, unto, come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. 
And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down? For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. Verse 27. So you can see it's just a recap. He's explaining to Joseph all the events that led up to this. You know, that they would be willing to bring Benjamin along, you know, even though his father would not let him go. But verse 27. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I saw him not since. So who's the son of, of uh, Israel that was torn to pieces? Well, no son was torn to pieces, right? But that's the lie that he's believed. He's, he's, he believed that Joseph was this, uh, killed by a, by a, let's say a lion or something, right? Killed by some wild animal. And he believed that Joseph was dead. This is why he's not willing to let Benjamin go, right? So this is a lie that the brothers have been keeping from their father this whole time. Hey, they did not have the humility to own up to their mistake. They, weren't, they didn't have the humility to say, we've done wrong, Dad. We've made a mistake. Let's keep going. Verse number, so what was I up to, guys? 31? 29, 29. And if you take this also from me, that's Benjamin, and mischief before him, you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die, and thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant becomes surety, for the lad unto my father. Remember we saw that on Wednesday, that Judah became the surety for Benjamin, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore, now therefore, now let's stop here for a minute. Judah, actually keep your finger there, go back to Genesis 37 for a minute. Genesis 37 verse 26. This is Judah saying these words, all right? Go back to Genesis 37 verse 26. Genesis 37, verse 26. Remember the story how Joseph was sold into slavery, right? When his brothers, actually their first intention was to kill him, to shed innocent blood. But this is what Judah says in verse 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Now you could say, well, Judah, you know, had a soft spot a little bit with Joseph. He didn't want to kill him, but he does something evil anyway, right? He is, he's the one that comes up with the decision to sell him, to sell him to the Ishmaelites, to sell him into slavery, right? And um, this was Judah's idea, all right? And he's going through this story to Joseph, explaining how, you know, the father's already lost one son, and he's not willing to lose another so, and what I want you to notice now is the change in Judah. When you read verse number 30, 33, back to chapter 44, Genesis 44, verse 33, this is what Judah now says. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant, that's himself, abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. So look, instead of, instead of selling off Joseph, all right, well, he did sell off Joseph, but now he says, no, look, you know what? It's time for me to take blame for this. It's time for me to step in. You know, let me be your servant. Let Benjamin go, All right? Verse 34, for how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? But he did that before with Joseph. He went up to the father without Joseph being there. He lied to the father. Now you can see there's a change in his heart. He says, how can I do this? Let's preventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. The fifth lesson, Lord, uh, brethren, in humility is that you need to learn from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. What do we see in Judah? He learned. Okay? He's done something extremely wicked with Joseph. But now when he comes to Benjamin, he's learned. He said, I'm not doing this again. Now, could he just leave Benjamin there and they could all leave? He, they could. Now, back many years ago with Joseph, they would have done that. They would have left Joseph. They, in fact, they did leave Joseph. And they went back to their father in peace. He's not willing to do that again. 
He's learned from his mistakes. And brethren, this requires humility because we've all made mistakes in the past. All of us, right? We've all made big mistakes in our past. But you'll know the difference between humility and pride because the one that's full of pride will defend their actions. They'll defend their mistakes. Christians will even say, oh, God understands. That God understands. No. No. <laughs> Stop making yourself feel better for the mistakes you've made. If you don't face the mistakes, you're going to keep making the mistakes again and again and again and again. All right? And it's such an embarrassment. You know, it's, it's such a shame when I've seen Christians who make mistakes. Well, God understands my situation. Look, God's Word tells you what's right and wrong. Just do what's right. And when you've made the mistake, just go and confess it to God. We saw before that His mercies are new every morning. Learn from the mistakes. Be willing to take the punishment. Learn from them and say, I've made a mistake. I've made an error. And I'm not willing to do that once again. I'm not willing to do that. That's the only way for you to grow. That's the only way for you to do what's right is to say, I've made mistakes in the past. I'm not going to make them again. Okay? And that requires humility because you've got to face the music. You've got to be there and say, I've, I've been wrong. I've made mistakes. You know... It's hard for people to like you if you're always saying you're right. <laughs> I'm always right. Everyone else is wrong. It's hard for people to like you. People tend to like someone that's willing to say, yeah, you know, messed up, you know, messed up. Hey, don't make the same mistake that I did. You know, I'm going to definitely try harder to, to not make those same mistakes. That's someone that's likable. Hey, you're, you're a human being. We can see that you've got humility about yourself. You're willing to, you know, uh, take down your ego, take down your pride, and be willing to say, I'm, I've made mistakes in my life. And to make those changes, not to do them again. So that's Genesis 44, brethren. Lessons in humility. What are those lessons once again? Number one, obey the authorities that you have in your life. Number two, render good for evil. Number three, be open to punishment for your sins. Number four, set aside your will to do God's will. And number five, learn from your mistakes. Let's pray.